So I'm going to talk about um, what we've been doing for our deployment here at NERSC. Um, and I decided to kind of focus on some of the customization stuff that we've done, maybe with the hopes that um, it would not need to be just us doing it. Um, and I'll do a little demo of what the, what the service looks like for users who log in. Um, and maybe at the end, or actually at the end, I have a list of things that we do that's not necessarily a wish list, but would be things that would be great to kind of find out what the real answer is because we have hacks and things like that that work, but uh, in the long run, they, you know, we, we need to do something better. Um, so in case you didn't notice, this is the building you're in right now, and um, we don't have offices. We all just come in at work and stand around like that. <laughs> so, it cuts down, it really lowered the construction costs <laughs> for the building. Uh, we have great air conditioning. <laughs> <Wow>. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, uh, so anyway, we're the production user facility for HPC and data for our Department of Energy um, funded researchers. So um, that's people at universities and other national labs in the country. Um, this is all our stuff. Uh, we don't have Edison anymore. We just unplugged that and disappeared uh, last week, basically. But we're um, essentially a huge file system and network with computers that we attach and then detach every five years or so. Um, um, NERSC, we have about 7,000 users on 700 different projects. Uh, they seem to write about 2,500 publications per year. Every year we hand out 10 billion NERSC hours, so there's a little extra factor on that, but um, basically the machines are up and being used all the time if possible. Um, these are the six science offices within the Department of Energy Office of Science and they represent you know, what our, our users do here. Um, uh, one of the things that's a trend for us and for other HPC facilities is uh, people showing up who have experimental and observational data sets. Um, at least within the Department of Energy, a lot of those people who maybe would have stood up a departmental cluster or depended on local resources at their university, and they write into their grant, you know, hey, we need to, to purchase this hardware and it needs to run for five years. Um, increasingly, uh, DOE has been kind of telling those people that they need to figure out a way to run at the, at the HPC facilities, the leadership class facilities, but mainly that means here. So there's all of these experiments that are showing up with lots of data. And the stuff they want to do with it is different from the kind of stuff we've been doing for the past uh, 20 years or so. Um, so we're shifting, we're adding basically, not really shifting, we're adding a bunch of data analytics, machine learning, um, real-time data analysis. Um, because a lot of what these people want to do is they want to take data at um, a beam line on a synchrotron or something like that, want to figure out how should I rotate the sample, but that's a big computation, so I need to ship the data over to some place that can actually be sitting there and ready to do a kind of larger parallel computation and send the answer back. And then they want to look at that and then decide, okay, I'm going to go five degrees more this way or whatever. Um, so this kind of dynamic workflow, human in the loop kind of analysis and steering of experiments is something that we're, we're really looking forward to helping people with. Um, the system we've got on the floor right now is Corey. This is our first system that was supposed to address the needs of simulation and data people at the same time. And so it has a bunch of these, uh, what we like to call data features, data friendly features, namely uh, Slurm, which is a, a kind of a, a huge engagement for us is working with the Slurm developers, SketMD containers, uh, Burst Buffer, Globus uh, file transfer, we have nodes set aside for, for data transfer, workflow, oh, workflow nodes, and then, uh, and then there was like one node for things like Jupiter as part of the contract. Um, and um, I think the, the Jupiter part is the best part. Um, why did we take over running a hub service? What we kind of noticed early on was users figured out how to run the notebook uh, by doing SSH tunneling, and then they could do Jupiter stuff at NERSC. And they wrote blog posts about it. Like here's how you use Jupyter at NERSC. You just install Jupyter and then you can set up this complicated SSH tunnel. And we thought maybe we should help them with that. Uh, no, it was, it was, maybe it was around that time actually. 
Um, so, okay, so we wanted to kind of embrace this and make people not have to uh, do SSH tunneling and all of that. Uh, so, you know, Jupyter Hub was, uh, helped us do that by letting us kind of standardize the service and authenticate people the way we wanted them in, uh, authenticated and maybe you know, help them kind of manage the, the process of setting that up. So hopefully they can just get started doing Jupyter stuff. Um, here's our, I guess, our history at NERSC. I guess we invited Fernando to give a NERSC user group talk back in 2013. Um, I guess we stood up uh, Jupyter installation on kind of some hardware that we said, hey, are you, are you throwing that away? <laughs> <laughs> Could we use it? So we, we, um, you know, we set up a, a Jupyter Hub instance there and a couple people used it and they liked it. The thing that they liked was that we could mount the global NERSC global file system. So they could see their data sitting on the project file system, basically. And that's the place where we tell people to put their data so that they can share it with other people. It's not the high performance while your job is running, you can, you can hit that uh, file system. But it's for sharing. So you know, people could, could make plots and they could uh, do little data analytics tasks on that, on that one node. Um, but the next thing that we did was move the place where notebooks spawn to be inside Cori. Well, on Cori. I don't mean inside because inside and outside Cori are different. But this is more outside Cori, but it's on a login node that we repurposed, or actually we set aside from the beginning for running Jupyter. So Cori has something like 24 login nodes, which is a lot for us. Really only 12 of them are in the load balancer for users to actually SSH into the higher numbered load uh, login nodes are reserved for these kind of big memory nodes or Jupyter or file transfer workflows and things like that. Um, so we had one, we got one node for launching notebooks and you know maybe 20 users used it for a while. Um, but I think somebody said yesterday like they you know you give users a resource it becomes theirs right and so everybody started wanting it for themselves on one note, basically. And so that, that worked for a while. And we actually kind of not the best uh, in terms of programming Jupyter components. So, you know, we kind of ran into some growing pains, but I think we worked them out. But even at the same time, Jupyter was like a super popular thing for a lot of our users. So like some of them are really fanatics, like I don't need anything but food and shelter in Jupyter. And then there's others who are, um, who are like I, I I use other supercomputer centers, but I really like to do my do a lot of stuff at Nurse simply because you have have Jupiter here. Um, so this was great for like maybe twenty or thirty users. Um, but as more users got on, they started to notice that it was one node and and they could like crash it. Um, so we had kind of two things to work on maybe. 2016, 2017, which was stability, and then of course the need to scale because it's just one node. Um, so acquiring additional nodes uh, for running Jupyter means you have to kind of um, do a lot of talking within your organization to figure out like, okay, so those nodes that we said we we're going to use for this, maybe we're going to change them around to be Jupyter stuff. And so a lot of the work that we did was was kind of socializing that. Um, our architecture, so I'll do a little architecture diagram and then I'll do a demo. Um, so we run the hub outside Cori. We run it on a, a container infrastructure called Spin. It's Rancher. Um, underneath it's running the old Rancher scheduler, but soon it's gonna turn into Kubernetes. Um, so we'll, we'll make that jump later this year. Um, so we run the hub there. We have a few other containers sitting alongside. We split out the database. Um, we're splitting out the proxy. Um, we have a couple extra services that we run alongside to call notebooks. We, we let them be idle for 24 hours and we shut them down. We have like a monitoring uh, container that runs alongside as well um, and sends information to our central data collect. So that's outside of Cori in a, in a Docker container. Um, and then um, we have two custom components in the classic sense. We have uh, our own authenticator because we have multi-factor authentication. Started out with GSI SSH, but that, that started going away. It was a real pain uh, to keep that working because it was a service that needed to run when the node came up. Uh, but we have our own custom authenticator that uses our internal authentication mechanism and our own kind of spawner infrastructure um, that lets us do what I'm about to show you. Um, so this is our authenticator here. We have an internal API for managing generation of internal 
IoT pairs, um, networks with our multi-factor authentication. Uh, once a user is authenticated, they can choose where their notebook is going to spawn in the center. So if Corey is down for maintenance, say, and they have a paper deadline and they want to make a plot, say, we don't want to tell those people, sorry. Um, so we have another container sitting inside, uh, inside of Spin that um, allows users to start up a notebook inside the shared container and at least make some, uh, and make their plots. With Kubernetes, we might be able to do something kind of, you know, more normal. Um, to spawn on, um, over on the login nodes on, on Corey, we've now been able to repurpose three nodes. Uh, three nodes total. We might be able to get a couple more. Uh, those spawn by using a SSH spawner that we've written. I think there's a couple SSH spawners out there, um, but we, 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 we sit on top of async SSH to do that. Um, once you have a notebook running on a login node on Cori, we've extended the internal network on Cori, which is all the compute nodes which don't have routable IPs generally. Um, we've extended that network out to the login node, these high numbered login nodes. So you could have a notebook running uh, on Cori 13 or 14 or 19 and talk to say a DAS cluster running in a job that you started up uh, through a regular job submission. So all you gotta know is the IP of the internal IP of that, of the head node of that job. Okay, so that's a super popular, we think this could probably be the most popular way that people are, are gonna combine Jupyter and um, the batch queues because their notebook gets to stay around basically forever. Um, there's another way to do this, which is kind of straight batch spawner. Start the notebook up in a job. Um, and we have a API for associating IPs on the fly to jobs for a small number of IPs. Um, so part of the job startup um, is, is, uh, is to hit that SDN API and get, a, get an IP address. So I should, I really, I wanna point out that um, a lot of the infrastructure services we've added on the center side for SSH authentication for this, this API, multi-factor authentication, SDN API, a lot of that stuff has been done by, by Shane here. So there's a lot of infrastructure stuff that, that we did that it really helps to have like somebody that understands how the, the center infrastructure works to be able to do these kind of things. Um, and then batch spawner, okay. Um, Shreyas who's here. I think he showed some extensions yesterday. Uh, one of them is this Jupyter Lab Slurm, uh, Jupyter Lab uh, plugin, lets you look at the queue and stop jobs and things like that. So that's in development. Actually, um, William over there has been working on it. Um, I think that it works now, but I think it didn't a few months ago, so. All right, so I'll do a quick demo. Um, all right, so we have, um, I didn't talk about how our deployment model, but we, we do a, like a monthly uh, deployment cycle. We have, somebody said I have A, B, dev, and test or whatever, and we have like dev, test, stage, and then the production, uh, the production stack. Um, so what I'm showing here is the stage one, which is the one that is like right before we do uh, the production deployment. Um, so we've customized the authenticator, we've customized the, the login page template so that we can stick in our flavor of um, multi-factor authentication. Thanks. Uh, and I'm logging in as myself. And so I'm staff, so I see some things uh, non-staff people uh, don't see. Uh, so this is our console or our homepage, and again, this is customized as well. Um, what we wanted to do was enable users to pick one of these to run at a time. So you can run on, this is the shared node CPU pricing button. What that is, is that's the Cori 19, Cori 13, Cori 14, the shared login. But if you want to submit a job using batch spawner, that's these two things over here. Um, and I mentioned that I'm staff, so I see things that uh, other users don't see on this page. Um, one of those is Gertie, which is our testbed system. So you can spawn on the testbed. And then over here, you have to be in a special QoS to be able to see the exclusive GPU nodes, um, which actually are running a separate Slurm controller, and it's not actually part of Cori. Um, but anyway, I, I mean, I can push these buttons and, and they'll do things. Um, but uh, 
So this is starting up a GPU, uh, a GPU node job. Um, it's fairly fast, but if I go to start up a job uh, on, the, on the CPU nodes using batch spawner, it's pretty slow because our Slurm is super, super busy. Okay, so it might take three minutes before your job starts up. And then this is um, a thing I'll come back to in a minute, which is our users are like always like, well, I wanna go back to the console, but it always leaves this extra window open. And if I stop my server, it, it makes the page gray and there's errors and stuff and I don't like it. Um, let me log the test user though. So I have a test user, all right. And I'll show you that it's a little bit different. Oh, I hope his password hasn't expired. I think it's using Cortana's Is it? Oh yeah, okay, thank you. Now it shouldn't be, right? Okay, whatever I'm doing is, maybe I did get an email that his password was about to expire. There. Got a I don't understand why it's not working. <laughs> but like the, the uh, what I was going to show you was how you don't see buttons if you're a regular user, right? Which is like I don't really need to show you that. But <laughs> just imagine just imagine there was less stuff up there. <laughs> but but the, the, the point I want to make though is how do we do that, right? We gotta know some stuff about me and we gotta know some stuff about users. And this is important for if we have, say, an options form, we don't wanna list all the accounts that live at NERSC, just the ones associated with the user. We don't wanna list all of the shifter images that are at NERSC, just the ones that they should care about. We don't wanna list all the reservations that are in Slurm right now, just the ones the user can submit to, say. So we have, a, we have internal services that we've exposed through a REST API or through REST APIs that let us get at that information. We do have a little bit of difficulty getting at that information at the home page, but we have no problem getting that at the options form stage because that's a callable, that's a callback, that's a coroutine. So we've shoehorned in a little fix that is kind of waiting there. I think it's not necessarily the right way to do it, but um, here's an example of our options form uh, for batch spawning. So I think I, I just mentioned that we have these internal REST APIs. We actually have a real production one here because you know, we need to charge people for stuff. Um, so that's something that, that we've developed, but things like what reservations are there and what shifter images are there. Uh, these are done, these were done for, for this demo um, by SSHing to the machine and running a command. So we should, we should fix that where Slurm should have a REST API. Um, anyway, so we have a new machine coming and Jupyter is gonna need to work on that. Um, this is what that page is gonna look like maybe in a year or so, you'll have all these options. This is the thing that will start the, the options form up. Um, okay, so this is a thing that, that we ran into is that we, we have these things we wanna expose to users at the center, our computational resources, our file systems. If they're gonna be submitting jobs, we need to make it easy for them to say, well, you, you know, use my default repo or use this particular repo that I wanna use for this job or I have a reservation and I can only submit from this repo or whatever. So we need to kind of simplify that. And so that means that a lot of intelligence has to be brought to the hub from our internal services. And basically we just generate REST APIs left and right. Yeah. Um, I was gonna ask you about the difference between login nodes and Cori. And, so Corey has login nodes where, which uh, you just log into. You can generally, the regular login loads are for um, compiling code, uh, messing with your, you know, writing software, looking at your data, maybe a little bit interactive stuff. But then submitting jobs through batch queue, that runs on compute nodes, which are not normally accessible the same the way from the outside. The compute nodes are on the high-speed network, which is disconnected from the rest of the, there's not a, a, an internal route into that network. But right. you also have a rack of Haswells that are interactive nodes. We have, so there is an interactive QoS uh, in the Haswell partition, and people can use those to say start up a Dask cluster uh, that a notebook running on a login node they could talk to. 
So one so of the that's, is the login nodes are shared, so everyone is yeah. copying the same login nodes. So, so often for something on the interaction. Right. Yeah. So often computing centers don't want you doing data analysis kinds of tasks on login nodes. Is that not true? Here? We have guidelines for um, what an what a appropriate level of use and resource consumption on login nodes is, and if somebody's exceeding that, then we talk to them. And we have a set of nodes that are reserved for doing a set of login nodes that we reserve for doing data analysis. Yeah, but and I didn't Jupyter say Jupyter nodes are reserved. Jupyter nodes are yeah. So these yeah. these ones these repurposed login nodes. I should mention that a normal login node has maybe fifty people on it. Any given time, a lot of them are just sitting there, hardly doing anything, like editing a file. Um, Jupyter, the Jupyter nodes, we currently have concurrently like 200 notebooks running at any given time across those three nodes. When it was 100, the node was going over like every other day. Um, C groups, memory C groups are in place so that if anybody kind of gets too big, we own them and they just don't know what happened. Um, but hey, don't do that. Um, so. So, but we, you know, we've we've talked to the systems group about about other alternatives like putting people into jobs they don't actually know are running, um, things that Slurm can do. Um, that might be, you know, it's just me and the C group or whatever. So, yeah. You mentioned the like spending other stuff. So if I spend something like a bot show like a DOS show, <laughs> can I still have access to that via my local? Yeah. Things? Does that have a concept of me as a user or? Just or could I connect to some other person's desk, uh, desk job? You, well, if you're running desk. You should be, you should be uh, ensuring that that doesn't happen by doing some TLS stuff. But really, um, yeah, we're we're kind of. I'm not. We're not really terribly worried about users figuring out how to grab other people's desk stuff, but we do. We do recognize that there are some security things that we need to address, and that's one of them. Also, if somebody starts up a Bokeh server and they have a SDN uh, entry, their Bokeh or sorry, um, Dask and the Bokeh server is sitting there. For instance, they don't have that guy behind TLS. People could look at what they're doing. People could send mess up their mess up their Bokeh server, I guess. But but we this is. These things I showed you like stage, right? So stage is not in production. So we don't have all this stuff ready for users quite yet because we're still working through some of those issues. Yeah. By default, you have access to those on the side from the login. So if someone starts up a service that's not protected, this is the same. Yeah, so it's not a Jupyter problem. Yeah. You yeah. want to make sure that your service has some kind of authentication. Yeah. We don't, yeah. So the way I look at it is, you could you could ask that about kind of anything you could do with SDN API. And so we're actually still reviewing: is that the way that we want to do this? And one of the things we're talking about is should we run CHP for the routing <laughs> on a on a service node? So yeah. Adam. Just looking at your last bullet point, um, asking about the safe quit extension we've got, which sends a. It's a save, save all or don't save, except log out, log you out of the hub and redirects you back to the landing page, which I think is what you're looking for. And closes the tab? Um, no, it, okay. it, it replaces the contents of the tab with the top level landing page. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, so it redirects. Jason brought that, I think it makes that. Okay, I don't mind it, but it confuses users a little bit. And then I see weird messages in the logs. Yes, but we, 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 after trying small terms, we found that when you say log out of the notebook, like yeah. ending up back at the top of the landing page seems to be an acceptable place for those. Okay. Points. Yeah, I appreciate. Yeah, I appreciate that. Okay. Um, and this is my last slide. Is in terms of wish list, which I should have put in quotes. It's not really wish list. It's just stuff we didn't really know how to do, and then thought maybe there's a thing to do. Um, all the stuff that I talked about that refers to like what uh, accounts a user can charge to, their shifter images, all that stuff, we're just sticking it on auth state, which gets set when you authenticate. That can be refreshed, which is great. So if they go into our accounting system and they sign up onto a new re allocation, we can probably get that. Um, the difficulty was getting it at the point we needed it, which was on our, our, our named servers. Uh, 
UI page, basically. Grabbing a hold of that uh, exactly means, I mean, you have to do it from, from inside a coroutine. So the get method there was okay, but it's kind of weird looking that it's just sitting there going, hey, by the way, go find out what all the user can do. Maybe there's a better place to put this. Um, so I, I think it's kind of jammed in there, but hey, it, it worked. Uh, security, I know there was like a discourse topic. I think, I think UV started it maybe a couple months ago. Um, one is we would really like to know about the possibility of notebook level audit. So every cell, every thing that goes through the uh, X term extension to Terminato, uh, we're interested in finding out how to log that. Um, Hub's fine. All that logging is going off to central data collect. Um, and we don't have to do anything. That's part of our infrastructure. Um, and uh, there is interest from our networking and security group on the, on the um, code review side of things. So if you, if, there, if you were looking for somebody to do this, I know of a person who would be really excited to do that. Um, and then there's a thing about wrap spawner that I could be just doing wrong, which is there's like a default, there needs to be like a default kind of spawner hanging out there and it's local process spawner right now for me in the container. And the only reason it doesn't work is because like there's no get PW name or whatever, and it just fails. But I think there should be a spawner that doesn't do anything. So this would be a good default for that, unless wrap spawner can do it in a different way. But something that would say, whatever you did, you picked a name for your server, like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, can't do that. So if I could figure out how to do that, that would be, that'd be great. But I thought this might be a neat, <laughs> a neat thing to do. Um, and then, all right, we can skip the last bullet point because we already talked about it. So, all right. So um, if you want to talk to me about like our deployment stuff and why we do things the way we do, uh, do them with Slurm and stuff like that, we're happy to talk about that uh, during the break, breakout or something like that. But, so that's it.